Well, thank you, Leslie. And hi, CFST. My name is indeed Chris Cummins. And oh my gosh, what an honor to be able to speak this morning. Uh, so that we're clear, this is live. This is a live broadcast. I'm in my home office studio. It is 11.10 a.m. Eastern Time on the 28th of October. And uh, I'm in uh, Leaside uh, in, in Toronto, near Bayview and Eglinton. So this is a live, real-time thing that's happening, and, and we're all experiencing it together. It was so cool for me to go into the exhibits last night and to, uh, to be able to click through and, and experience at least some of what we do at a, you could call normal, conference. Before we get going too far, I'd, I'd like to share something that I learned recently. Um, there was a, a Harvard psychology professor in the late 1800s. His name was William James. And if you've, if you've ever studied psychology, you might even recognize this name. Some would argue that William James was one of the fathers of, of modern psychology. What William James said in his really early text was that the greatest discovery we've made in my lifetime, which is his lifetime, in the study of human psychology is that human beings, we can alter our external circumstances by altering our attitudes of mind. Let me just pause here for just a sec. Does that make sense? I'm pausing so you can say to yourself whether or not that makes sense. It, it does, right? Or we can put it slightly differently. Um, can we agree that what you and I think about at any given moment has an impact on our feelings? Yes? No? Yeah, of course. Of course we can. Yeah, if, I, if I'm thinking awesome thoughts and I'm having a blast, it changes how I feel about things. Okay, fair. So what you and I think about at any given moment changes how we feel about stuff. How you and I feel has an impact on our actions. We can agree on this, yes? Sure, sure we can. And our actions, well, clearly, that has an impact on our outcome. So what William James is saying, and slightly differently, is what you and I think about at any given moment has an impact on our outcome. So this is this concept of, of mindset. And I want to I follow sort of two through lines together uh, for, uh, for our time together this morning. And this first one is this idea of mindset, that your thoughts and my thoughts have an impact on how you and I feel, which then have an impact on how you and I act, which then clearly have an impact on our outcome. Fair enough? I'm just going to park that, that idea of, of mindset for just a moment. Um, the second thing the second sort of through line is a little trend that I've noticed. I've been doing this now full time for 15 years and predominantly in Canada, but I do some work stateside as well. And in the, in the COVID world, I'm doing a lot of work from my home office and from some other studios. I find it interesting though, in all of my preparation calls and all of my post meeting calls as well. Um, but mostly in the, in the prep lead up calls, just before I go on stage, whether it's a virtual, we had, I think, Gosh, our first call was 8.30 this morning, then another call at 9.30. We had AV checks and things. And I'm always asking, you know, tell me, tell me about who's in the audience. Tell me about what's going on. So I did a ton of research calls, and I spoke to some people on the board. I spoke to uh, uh, some past presidents, and I was trying to figure out within the CFST and within sort of the business at large, um, how, how, how open-minded is, is the group going to be? You know, can we try non-standard uh, virtual keynote stuff? Can, can we try to engage in, in different ways? And um, but here's something I've noticed. Pre-COVID, when you live in Toronto and you get on an airplane and you fly to Vancouver, the nice people of Vancouver, they're, they're great, they're welcoming, they're super friendly until they find out that you're from Toronto. Yes? <laughs> Vancouverites, agree? I mean, as soon as you find out that we're from the East, you're like, oh gosh, they're from the East. But you go to Vancouver and uh, just before a big presentation, a president or someone, a senior leader will pull me aside uh, from an organization. They'll say, okay, Chris, just so you know, um, that, you know, we're Vancouver based. This is a unique marketplace we have here in Vancouver. So about 15 years ago, I was thinking, you know, I should start taking notes on this stuff. So I started documenting all kinds of stuff. And I, I noticed a trend when you leave Vancouver and you go to Vancouver Island, uh, there's a city called Victoria in Vancouver Island. Um, and then you go up to Nanaimo as well. I mean, the birthplace of Nanaimo bars, for crying out loud. Uh, but Nanaimo and Victoria, they'll tell you, this is a unique marketplace. You have to understand, whatever you think you know, worked in Vancouver mainland, it's not going to work in Nanaimo. This is a unique marketplace. Then you go up the, the, the um, um, I can't remember the name of the highway right now, but you go up the highway on the Vancouver Island, and, uh, and then you hit Courtney and Comox, and they say, this is a unique marketplace here, Chris. Whatever you think might work in Nanaimo, it's not going to work. 
So I'm taking a lot of notes, of course, over the last 15 years. And then you get on those float planes that fly you from the island back to the mainland. And if you get a chance, do the helicopter. That's an incredible opportunity to fly over uh, the bridge coming back into Vancouver. Then you go to Edmonton and Calgary. And, and you notice a trend there. Calgarians love to hate Edmontonians. If, if, you're, if you're from Alberta, I think you already know that. Uh, it's not just a hockey rivalry, which I find interesting. Uh, but you'll, you'll go to Edmonton and they'll say, hey, Chris, just so you know, but this is a unique marketplace here in Edmonton. You go to Calgary and, and they say there's a unique marketplace here in Calgary. Then you go to Red Deer, Alberta, which is right halfway between uh, Calgary and Edmonton. And, and they pull you aside there, you know, just so you know, this is a unique marketplace. And, and he's, okay, yeah. And, and I ask in, in a lot of cities, you know, what, what do you guys do here for fun? Like, where, where do you like to go? And in Red Deer, <laughs> they said, we leave. <laughs> but I, I asked them in Red Deer, you know, so tell me about the, and it's a unique marketplace. We're not like Edmonton, we're not like Calgary. Then you start bouncing through the prairies, right? And you hit Saskatoon and Regina and Winnipeg. And there's a unique marketplace here. It's very unique here. And, you know, we have the prairies and it's unique. Okay. Then you start bouncing through Ontario, right? You hit Windsor, Ontario. It's unique here. And then Stratford and Guelph. It's very unique the way we do things in the farming community here. And then you get into the greater Toronto area and the Golden Horseshoe. It's unique marketplace here in, Bang in, in, uh, in Toronto. You see a trend. I think, I think you see where I'm going with this, right? You hear enough times, it's totally unique. Then you go over the border. You pass Kingston, Ontario, and you, you go to Montreal. And uh, the, uh, the people from La Belle Province, right? And you sit down at a meeting there, and they say, Hey, hey, Chris Daffer. They pull you aside. You know, not that I'm Marche. It's here, Montreal, c'est unique. <laughs> and you look at your new friends in, in Montreal, and you try your hardest. I grew up in Mississauga, Ontario. You try your hardest. You get your 13 years of French immersion training, and you're like, Bonjour. <laughs> Bibliothèque. Pamplemousse. That's 13, 13 years of French immersion training. They say it's a unique marketplace. Notre Marché is unique à Montréal. Then you, you cross some other provincial boundaries, right? You go to the Maritimes and they pull you aside in Fredericton. This is a unique marketplace, Chris. You have to understand whatever you think might work in that marketplace, not going to work here. Then you go to Halifax, economic hub, right? You go to Moncton. It's a unique marketplace here. Uh, and then you go to St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, have you ever... Ask yourself, like, have you ever been to, to Newfoundland? Have you ever, if you get a chance, once all this lockdown stuff is lifted, go get, get to Newfoundland. The people of Newfoundland are so loving and so welcoming. It's, it's incredible. But the owner of a business pulls me aside before in pre-COVID, before a presentation uh, for his uh, whole team. And, and he says, you know, just so you know, put his arm around me like this. He goes, just so you know, buy our marketplace here in Newfoundland. She's unique, eh? Okay? And at this point, I'm feeling playful, right? And, and you know, I, I put my arm around him, and I'm like, I heard that, by fire by. And, uh, and he tightens his grip around me, and he goes, oh, are you making fun? And I was like, well, kind of. And, uh, and we're giggling. And then he, he tightens his arm around me, pulls me down, and he gives me one of these, you know, rubs the top of my head. And, and you know, like I'm, I haven't had one of those since I was 12, I think, from my brother. And he goes, come on, Chris, we're going drinking. <laughs> yeah, so we go to a place called the... Uh, was it called the Sundowner Saloon in, in St. John's, Newfoundland? And um, if you've ever been to Newfoundland, you know what I'm about to tell our crew this morning, right? They, they, we go to the saloon and they say, now, Chris, you, sir, as an honorary Newfoundlander, you've got to be screeched in. And I said, okay, I don't know what that is, but when you're in Rome, let's do the thing. Fine. And um, so they, they bring out a shooter of screech, right? Which is rum. It's not moonshine, but uh, it's powerful stuff, man. Uh, they bring out this screech, and uh, and then they they say, "Okay, bye. You gotta you gotta be screeched in." Okay, fine. I'll do that. Let's let's pray. So stand on this small little stage here, and they bring out a. Yeah, you already know it, right? They bring out a dead fish. They they bring out a cod, and and they go, "Okay, now you gotta kiss the cod." And I'm like, "Sorry, yeah, it's a routine here. We gotta be an honorary Newfoundlander." So I'm 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 leaning in. Okay, I don't want to kiss this cod, so I pretend, right? I'm sort of okay. I pretend to kiss the cod. And I, <laughs> I wish I had video of this. Uh, he, he, I, I pretend to kiss the cod, and he goes, no, 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 Chris, no, you got to do it like you mean it. <laughs> and I was, I was like, okay, um, I don't mean it, but okay, sure. So I lean in, I make, I, I make contact full on with this dead fish, and, and I'm, you know, it's quite disgusting, actually. Uh, and I, I do this shooter of moonshine and uh, chase it back, and then you have to raise your right hand, repeat after me, you know, yes, I is a screecher. 
uh, Long May Your Big Jib Draw. There's a whole really neat poem. And of course, the big jib, you might know, is that part of the sail that is the largest that catches the most wind. And if your big jib is drawing, that means the wind is at your back or the wind is is pushing you forward and you're, you're making the most use of it if the big jib is drawing. It's It's really cool. Anyhow, I'm doing the shooter of moonshine, and I said, you know, I have to make a phone call. I'll be right back. So I phoned, I phoned my wife, right? And I said, hey, hey, Sheila. Yeah, I, uh, I found one. She goes, what's that? I said, unique. <laughs> Here's my point. If before every single engagement in the last 15 and a half years, and loads of engagements between March and now, all virtually, for every single one of those engagements, if you heard, put yourself in my shoes, if you heard this is a completely unique marketplace, this is a completely unique industry, what would you start to think to yourself if you were in my, in my shoes? I think you already know, right? You'd start to think one of two things. You start to think, okay, either there's a lot of really unique, or maybe, maybe there are some similarities in these industries. And maybe there are some similarities in these geographic marketplaces and in these verticals. And I was, I was wrestling with how can I communicate with you this morning? How can I rest, how can I communicate with you sort of what, what I'm noticing from my perspective? And then I found it preparing for the presentation. I, I, I found a, a four or it was a five hour lecture and it was buried in hour number four of this lecture by a guy named Wayne Dyer. If you get a chance, read some of his stuff. Wayne Dyer is W-A-Y-N-E Dyer, D-Y-E-R. He wrote a book called The Power of Intention. I, mean, I can save you the 20 bucks, I suppose, if... If, if you want to do something badly enough, write down the goals. And if you intend to do it badly enough, it, something strange happens in your brain chemistry and in your unconscious. You start to unconsciously look for opportunities to make that thing that you intend to happen, happen. But the opposite of it is also true. If you intend, even unconsciously, for something not to happen, your brain will go find evidence of that in this sort of negative feedback loop. Power of Intention is a fascinating read, but here we are. We've got Wayne Dyer speaking for five hours. He was at a conference in Toronto years ago, and I bought a bunch of audio cassettes off of eBay. I gave them to a friend of mine. He turned them into uh, audio files I can listen on my phone. So buried, buried in the fourth hour of this five-hour lecture, Wayne Dyer starts telling the story about this Seattle, Washington Special Olympics. And, and just so we're clear, the, the Special Olympics is for people with mental uh, challenges, right? Whereas the Paralympics, that's for participants with, with physical. Is that fair? Does that make sense? Okay, so we have nine runners lined up at the starting line for the 100-yard dash. It's not a very long race. I've done some research. I've since discovered... This didn't happen at the Seattle, Washington Special Olympics. It happened, though, but it was at the Spokane, Washington Special Games. So here we are at starting line. Nine runners lined up, poised, ready to go at the starting line. Starter pistol goes off, right? Bang! All nine, they take off. They start running down this relatively short race. Remember, we've got mental challenges. Not the physical. This is Spokane, Washington Special Games. Nine runners, bang, they take off. They start running down this race. Except one guy. I don't know how he does it, but he trips and he falls. He falls right at, right at the starting line. And right, he's on the ground. He, he starts rocking back and forth and, and he starts crying. The other eight runners, they're still going for it in their race. Except one girl. With Down syndrome, she hears the dude, she hears the crying, the commotion. She stops running in this 100-yard race. She turns around pretty quickly, walks back to the starting line. She bends down, kisses the guy on the cheek very gently, just sort of a little kisses him on the cheek. 
stands up proudly, swings her arms really high, right? Really proudly. She's like, there, <laughs> that'll make it better. Isn't that cool? That's not even the cool part of the story, my friend. Oh, the cool part of the story is that none of the remaining seven runners cross the finish line. All of them stopped in various parts of their race. All of them turned around. They walk back to the starting line, pick up this guy who fell. They grab the girl with Down syndrome. Organically, nobody's in charge of this. Just organically. Grab the girl with Down syndrome, pick the dude up, and they all just start, they start linking arms. They're like, come on, let's, yeah, let's do that. Come on, link arms. And all nine of them, they linked arms and they walked down this hundred yard dash together. You're there, right? You, right? You can picture this. By the time, I'm going to drink some water. By the time they hit the midpoint, the place was blowing up. <sighs> By the time they crossed the finish line, the place exploded. Now, we can talk about buyers and we can talk about sellers of components and food. We can talk about R&D sessions that can't happen anymore because we're not allowed to gather. We can talk about conferences not being allowed to happen. We can talk about whether or not the supply chain is affected. And we can talk about whether, um, uh, you know, health conscious consumers are going to be more focused on health or if they need more comfort food. We can talk about whether or not, you know, companies making frozen pizzas are blowing the doors off and companies making pasta are lowering the number of SKUs in order to meet demand. And we can talk about how we're seeing a, a resurgence, a second sort of hiccup in the supply chain. Um, and we can also talk about the fact that companies have had to amp up production in order to fill, backfill all of these massive shelves that were being emptied, but then consumer buying dropped. So really net net, there wasn't as much selling going on of product. It was the same number of products, just a big pr bulk purchase and then dropping. We can talk about massive changes in consumer buying behavior. And we can talk about the changes within your dynamic teams and from research and development to new product and testing to acquisition to trying recipes. We can, we can talk about all that and we are going to go into some of that today, this morning in the keynote. Before we go into any of that stuff, we need to agree on something, my friend. We need to agree that those nine runners reminded everybody in that stadium, and now all of us here at the CFST virtual conference, of something that I'm going to call the human condition. We can call it the human experience. And there's a whole mess being human. Even pre-COVID, there's a massive mess. Being human is hard. And there's a whole bunch of interconnected stuff. One of those little interconnected pieces is that human beings, you and I, need people. And people need us. And when, not if, when you and I find a way to give value to another human being, generally speaking, they will find a way to give value back to us. Now, this is something that behavioral economists and social psychologists agree upon. This is what they call the law of reciprocity. You already know it. You already live it anyway. I want to give you an example. The law of reciprocity says if you get value from another human being, generally speaking, you and I will feel compelled to return value to that person or at least slough value back into the system. Is that law always true? No. I mean, think, think about it for, for yourself, in your own circles of influence, in your own families. Are some people way better at the giving of the value piece and not so good at the, at the, or pardon me, are some people really good at the taking of the value piece, but not so good at the giving of the value piece? Right? You give value, give value, you, you do everything for them, and you're like, here, here's tons of value. I've done lots of the, you know, this law of reciprocity. You should be kicking in any time now. And then it's almost like they pull you aside. They say, hey, Chris, listen, I, I, I apologize. You must be mistaken. I'm, I'm a taker. I do net taking. I don't, I don't really give that much. I... <laughs> Can you think of someone like this? 
sure, we all can. And then you add cortisol. You add these stress response neurotransmitters. And we're working from home in very strange new environments. And we're not able to gather. We can't go to restaurants. And you pour a ton of cortisol into this sort of net giving, net taking exchange. And what we find is that it tends to drop off. We're like, I'm so, I'm so... I'm just trying to protect myself here. I can't really slough value out into the system right now. I'm circling the wagons and I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to stay uh, safe, keep myself and my, my, uh, my mind and my sense of self safe. I can't really give value. Well, it turns out there's, there's, if you ask a group of 500 or 1,000 people, I've done this a number of times now. If you ask them, hey, can you think of anyone who's negative all the time? Someone who's, who tends to be, you know, just a fun sponge, right? They could take the, go to Disney and they'd have a bad time provided Disney was open. And you're like, yeah, I can think of someone. Ask yourself, do, do they tend to be net givers or net takers? Kind of a rhetorical question, right? They tend to be net takers. They, they will take lots of value, but they don't really slough much value back into the system. So these parallel lines that I want to follow for our time together, that first one is this idea of mindset. It's not just my mindset and your mindset. It's also the mindset of other people. And it's not just the thoughts that you and I have that change our feelings, which then affect our actions, which then alter our outcome. It's also the thoughts that you and I allow other people to inject into our mind that impacts what we think about, which alters our feelings and our actions and our outcome. So it turns out your, your peer group and what you're putting into your brain in this environment in October 2020 and November 2020 and into December 2020, what you're reading, what you're consuming online, what you're consuming in social media, the people you're choosing to hang out with, the emails that you're forwarding and, and uh, sending and receiving, for, all of that stuff impacts what we think about is possible and what we then act upon. Let's change gears. Think back to when GPS devices were first introduced in vehicles. I know we've got some students on the, on, on the uh, session today. Uh, we've got some seasoned veterans. We've got academia represented. We have buyers. We have sellers. We have many people represented in various levels of involvement in, uh, in food service, or, uh, food science, I beg your pardon. And I, I want you to think back especially if you're in your 40s or so, but maybe even late 30s, when GPSs were first introduced. Uh, I got the Garmin C330. It was 11 or 1200 bucks when they first launched this thing. The screen was probably about this big and it suction cupped to the windshield of my car. And it was absolutely incredible. It blew my mind that I could go anywhere without needing directions anymore. It, it saved so much time. I don't know if you, if you go back even further pre-GPSs as a sales rep, you, you'd be trying to get to a meeting and you would, you'd be you turning and, and realizing you'd have to go to page J7 and flipping to it. GPS shows up, you're like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but they would talk to you, right? I mean, the, the series and the Google Maps and the, and the Apple Maps stuff, that, that talks to us now with a synthetic voice. But it turns out you can actually download voices now to these things. But think back when you first got the GPS and you fired it up, did it talk to you? The answer is probably yes. Think back when you first got your first GPS and even subsequent ones. Um, did it have a default? Did it have a male or a female voice? Turns out, I'm polling a lot of people. It turns out most of them are coming with female voices. So I, I was curious about that. And I, I phoned the nice people at Garmin. They make GPSs. And I said, hey, what's the deal with all of your GPSs coming shipped with a female voice? And they said, um, that's easy. <laughs> it turns out there's science behind it. It turns out guys don't want other guys to tell them where to go, <laughs> which, which is fascinating in itself. But here we are. We've got the GPS device. And I was going for a drive, and I realized you could start downloading voices to these things. And, and so I did. I, it turns out you can put Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, you can put Elmo on your GPS. We put Elmo on the GPS, and he's like, turn left again, again. And we put Mrs. Doubtfire on the GPS. She's like, oh, dear, no, there's a run by fruit and You've got to take Highway 407, dear. And it was absolutely, it was a riot. Uh, my favorite one to put on there was, was Arnold Schwarzenegger because that guy's timeless. You know, he's like, get off the highway right now, hurry. Get in the chopper for crying it loud. I digress slightly. It's kind of fun to do voices. Here's the thing about the GPS, my friend. It looks up at the sky at a billion, over multi-billions of dollars of U.S. military hardware, right? And it looks up and says, where am I? And that whole system, you're currently here. Thank you. Now, if you're in your driveway and you know where you are, 
that that whole satellite system doesn't you don't need it to tell you where you are and if you're in your driveway and you know where you are and you don't type in a destination into your gps you don't type a destination into your google maps how helpful is the bazillion dollar system it's useless don't look now my friend that principle is exactly the same in your life. That principle is exactly the same in, in your business, in your academic career, in all of your ventures. If you don't start every day with a destination in mind, by the end of today, that is where I want to be intellectually, uh, emotionally, relationship wise, whatever. If you don't start every single day with a destination in mind, I promise you'll be busy. You'll be more busy than ever in COVID because you just bang away on Zoom calls and you'll start getting Zoom fatigue and people say, how are you? I'm busy. I'm one of the busiest people to be busy. I'm working more now during COVID lockdown than I ever did. I'm putting more hours in at my desk. Sound familiar? And it turns out that if we don't punch in a destination into this sort of virtual GPS system, if you want, if we don't punch in a destination into this virtual Google Maps at the start of every single day, you and I will be busy, but we'll have a hard time being productive. So I want you to grab a pen, a piece of paper nearby, and a very quick exercise. I want you to just get a blank, get a blank sheet of paper like this. I want you to draw a line down the middle just like this. And you write personal on one side and career on the other. Personal and career. And throughout today, when you're meeting with other people and you're networking and you're connecting with other people, I want you to continue to add to this list. I want you to start writing down some things that you'd like to accomplish. And maybe it's within the next month, it might be within the next 12 months, it might be within the next 365 days, it might be within the next 720 days. You might even start to consider writing down some of the things you've never had the guts to write down before. The things that maybe scare you a little bit. You say, well, one day I'll do that. One day I'd like to do that and that and those things over there too. You're going to get them started today? No, no, no. I'm nervous and scared about them today. I'll just, I'll put them off just far enough that I don't have to be uncomfortable about the goals. But I, I'd like you to write them, write them down. It turns out it was an exercise like this. 18 years ago that someone actually gave me the gift of just a few minutes to write down some things I wanted to accomplish. If you go back to Wayne Dyer in the Power of Intention book, if you write it down, you commit it to paper, your brain, for some strange reason, our unconscious mind starts to take it more seriously. Like, oh, I thought that was just a dream. That's a full-on legit goal. Okay, cool. Uh, let's look for opportunities. And unconsciously, you'll start to look for opportunities. Now, if I have you do this exercise and I say, write down all of the things that suck about business and life and career and relationships and all the things that are going bad, you'll write all those things down. Your unconscious mind will be paying more attention to those things and it will then go look for more evidence and it will cause a, a feedback loop of that. And then your list will get larger and larger. But I've noticed as I approach my late 40s now, I've noticed that when you hang out with people who have larger, we call them audacious goals. They're, they want to accomplish big things. You hang out with people who have stated goals and they tack back to them every single day. They tend to, to make you more of a possibility thinker yourself. I want to give you an example. And this has nothing to do with food science. This has nothing to do with business. When I decided that I wanted to ask my girlfriend uh, for my girlfriend's hand in marriage, I wanted to get married. I, I figured I, I'd like to do something big. I want to do something really big. So I started brainstorming. I started writing down some goals. I didn't know how I'd do it. And I just started writing down some big things that maybe I don't have enough money at the time. I, I don't know how this would possibly happen. But I just started jotting down some things that, you know what would be really cool is if this. Okay, write that down. What about this? It would be awesome is maybe if I could write a book. Okay, um, maybe you want to have a, a nice garden patch in your backyard. Maybe you'd like to have a child or grandchildren or Maybe you'd like to have a different spouse. I don't know. Whatever your, whatever your goals are, we need to write them down. And it sounds so strange because we've all heard this so many times, but I want this to be a, a reminder for you that we, you and I, we need to pause a bit. We just need to reflect on, so where are we, where are we trying to take this? 
And if, if we're all in a holding pattern waiting for everything to open up again and all the planes to start flying and all the conventions to come back and everyone to go back into offices, you and I are going to be waiting a really long time. So it's time now to start to embrace what's happening. And it's time now to start to jot down goals and figure out where can we take this thing? What can we accomplish that we didn't really think we could? What can we write down that we didn't really know was possible? So I wrote down, for example, I don't know how I would do it, but um, she's a big canoeer. She loves going on canoe trips. If there were a way somehow to maybe do a float plane, one of those planes that lands on water and show up at one of her camping trips, that'd be cool. I wrote down, uh, climb a mountain. I wrote down, take a helicopter ride up to a glacier. I wrote down, hike Mount Kilimanjaro. I, I wrote down, go on a safari in South Africa. All of these massive things that I couldn't afford. I had no idea how to do any of them, but I just wrote them down anyway. And in a, in a state of overwhelm where you and I and many of our peers are right now, a lot of us aren't taking an opportunity to write down some of the things we'd like to do, the things we'd like to accomplish in our life, in our career, our relationships, and with our family. Because we're so busy just getting through the day. So I want us to pause for a second and consider this. Some of those things you write down, even while you're writing them down, your brain is going to tell you, we can't do that because of this, that, and this. We can't possibly accomplish it. One of my favorite quotations of all time was Henry Ford. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or think you cannot, either way, you're right. So I figured, okay, I'll write these things down. Fast forward a whole bunch of years, and I discover Sheila's going on a canoe trip, a girl power canoe trip weekend with um, three other girlfriends. They had two canoes. I thought, oh my gosh, they're planning this thing well in advance. This gives me loads of time. So I figured out when they're doing it, and I started calling around. I called a bunch of friends. Hey, do you know anybody with a float plane? And, no, I don't. And I found a friend of mine from Western. It turns out his dad uh, has a, a float plane. 19, it was a 1965 Super Cup, fully restored. I phoned him up, and I said, Mark, can I talk to your dad? Oh, yeah, sure. Put him on. So his dad gets on the line. Oh, Chris, nice to talk to you again. Haven't seen you in a long time. How are things? And I said, great. Listen, um, you know, Sheila, Girl Power Canoe Trip Weekend, um, float plane, understand you have one. Is this something you might be interested in? I'm just, I'd love to know if, if, if you have any ideas or, or if you'd like to do it yourself. And he goes, gosh, that sounds really fun. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Now, this was many months in advance, but I'm thinking, holy cow, this is happening? It, it all starts with a single step though, right? So then you fast forward a bunch of months and the girls are all getting together and, and uh, uh, planning all of their stuff. And then here we are Wednesday before they're leaving on the Thursday morning. And I've ordered a ring and a custom ring and I phoned her girlfriend and I said, hey, Nicole, I'm going to go pick up the ring tonight on a Wednesday night. Sheila's taken off on her Girl Power Canoe Trip weekend on Thursday morning. Um, can you come see the ring? So Nicole comes to see the ring. She says, oh my gosh, Sheila's going to love this. It's absolutely amazing. She starts crying when she sees the ring, which was pretty cool. So I've got the ring in my pocket. Paid for it. We're ready to rock. I come home. Traffic's a little bit crazy. I come into the house and, uh, and Sheila, or the apartment at the time, we we're living at uh, uh, Avenue and, um, uh, or pardon me, St. Clair and Young, between Avenue and Young. And uh, with this tiny little apartment. And I come into the apartment and shut the door and I look over and there's the table set and she's pretty much finished her dinner. I realized, okay, yeah, so I've kind of missed that. And she's not in the greatest mood. Clearly, I think you can picture the scene. You can picture the scenario, right? <clears throat> and she says um, those those words that that strike fear in our hearts, right? I, I'm sure you've experienced this before. Those those four words. We need to talk. You know, <laughs> you know those words, right? You know the ones, right? Uh, that's when we start to get anxious. As soon as you hear those words, it doesn't even matter what's happening. Like the brain, the blood rushes from your brain, right? We get, we get our, our knees are weak, our palms are sweaty. We probably got some vomit on our sweater already. It might even be mom's spaghetti. That's the M&M reference if you know the M&M. Anyhow, we get nervous. And it's the fight or flight mechanism that kicks in. And we get bathed in cortisol and all kinds of other neurotransmitters that aren't that great, but they're to hype us up and get ready. Turns out we get butterflies in the moment because that's the blood, of course, rushing from our digestive system, which you already know. Uh, and it's running, it's rushing into the muscles so we can fight or, or, or take off. Uh, it also sucks the oxygen rich blood out of our brain because our brain doesn't really need as much of that for executive functioning. So we, you and I become less intelligent under massive panic and stress. Sound familiar? When I'm really panicked, I can't find my phone. I don't know where my keys are. Where's that document I was looking for? And you just, 
calm down for a second. The, the executive functioning is almost turned off when we're in a high state of stress and panic. We need to talk, okay? And we sit down, and she said, uh, we've been living together for four years, and I'm going away on this girl canoe trip weekend. You, you sir, you've got some thinking to do. And I've got, right, I've got the ring in my pocket. And the ring is like, let me out, let me out. And I said, well, well stay there. I'm doing this on my terms. <laughs> and I said, well, it's, it's not happening now. And it's certainly not happening on our vacation, which happens after she comes back from the canoe trip. So you just, you need to relax. Which, by the way, is not an ideal thing to say to the girlfriend that you're living with to tell them to relax. So I enjoyed my, my evening on the couch. I woke up the next morning and all the girlfriends are showing up and they've got canoes on the cars and oh, Chris, hey, good to see you. Hey, Leslie, good to see you. Barb, oh, nice to see you. Um, but have a great trip, everybody. And Sheila, are we going to hug? No, we're not hugging either. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Awkward. She's still pretty upset. You've got some thinking to do, Chris. So she takes off on the Girl Power Canoe Trip weekend. I'm super excited at this point. Thursday morning, I head into work. Very excited. We get into Friday morning. I'm, I'm uh, uh, show up to work, and I, I phone the dude in Peterborough, and I said, "Hey, uh, just want to make sure we're still a go for for Saturday. You know, please give me a shout. Uh, make sure everything's still, you know, everything's timing and where we're going to meet and stuff." And uh, this on a voicemail. He calls me back, and and he he gets very hushed. He said, "Chris, um, we need to talk." Okay, I'm listening. And he said, listen, I've been looking at the weather and I've been looking at the charts and things. This is the Chinaguchi Waterway. It's about a four-hour drive north of Toronto, near Sudbury, Ontario. And uh, I'm going to have to fly from Peterborough, Ontario, to Toronto to pick you up at Toronto Island, then I'll fly up and then fly back, go back to Peterborough. And I'm looking at the weather and the gas consumption. This is a 1965 fully restored aircraft. I don't think, um, I don't think we're going to be able to do this. Do you know that feeling? You, you know that feeling. Where you're going, what do I, what happens now? Well, you have a decision to make in that moment, right? You decide, okay, I guess I'm just going to accept that. Or you decide, I think I'm going to double down and go after this. Well, I decided, as a, I was a sales guy at the time, I decided I'm just going to double down. Let's do this. So I picked up the phone. I called pretty much everybody in Ontario. If you're from Ontario on this conference, you probably got a call from me. I was phoning everybody. I said, hey, do you know anybody in the float plane? No. Do you know anybody in the float plane? And then I paused. I thought, wait, I should phone places that have airplanes. You should fish where the fish are. You should hang out with people who have a positive mindset, who are early adopters. Like everybody who's chosen to attend a conference like this, my friend. A virtual conference? Hang out with these people. These are all people who are open-minded enough to even attend today. Take full advantage of the networking and hang out with these people. Fish where the fish are, because this is where the opportunities are. So I started phoning airports, regional airports and flight schools. And I've, I've had this whole list I put on my headset, very similar to this one right here. And I just started smiling and dialing, right? I was just banging away on the phones and calling everybody. And eventually I called this guy. He says, wow, you really want to do this? And I said, yeah, I sure do. How do you know? And he said, because you called me half an hour ago. And I said, well, what did you say then? And he said, uh, he said I said, no. And I said, well, what are you going to say now? And he said, I love your passion. You clearly want to do this. and You're not going to give up. I said, I'm not going to give up. He goes, let me make a call. Time out here for two seconds. When you are positive and engaging, it's attractive. And other people want to hang out with people that make them feel good. Other people want to hang out with them, with people that make them feel like there are opportunities. Because there are. With every change, there are huge opportunities. What if you were that person? What if you helped other people to see opportunities instead of obstacles? What if you made that little call to see if you could connect someone who could connect someone who could connect someone to maybe help someone else accomplish a thing? Giving instead of trying to take. There's a guy named Tim Cork who wrote a book called The Three G's of Leadership. He's an awesome guy. He's a, an acquaintance of mine. I can't call him a true friend. I haven't seen him in a long time, but my gosh, I have so much respect for Tim Cork. Three G's of leadership, he says, are give, give, give. <laughs> In fact, Tim Cork coined the phrase, 
net giving. He said, stop networking. Be the only person at a networking event not talking about yourself and not trying to further your agenda. Instead, be the only person at a networking event who's going to practice net giving. Well, what is net giving? Net giving is figuring out what other people are trying to accomplish and then helping them do it. I've already mentioned I'm in my late 40s. I've been doing this now since I was 18 because someone was clever enough to show me how giving of value is like a karma play. It's an investment. You put, you make an investment in the karma bank. You just, you pay things forward, even expecting nothing in return. Last year, I got hired by someone who runs a $3 billion business that I met when we were both completely broke in university. How? Well, because they, they enjoyed our interaction then, they followed my career, and they saw what I was doing, and they asked me to speak at their conference to teach all of their salespeople. Net giving works. So how do you practice net giving? The best thing you can do is you find out what other people are trying to accomplish instead of talking about your own objectives. Fair? So he says, well, let me make a call. I'll get back to you. Phone rings. Five minutes later. Hey, it's me. Uh, I want you to call this guy's name, JR. So I phone JR. Hi, it's a uh, good afternoon, ABC company. Hi, I'm looking for JR. Is he expecting your call? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, I think so. Okay, I'll put you through. Hi, this is JR. Hi, JR. My name's Chris. Uh, do you know why I'm calling? He said, yep, sure do. I said, oh my gosh, uh, cool. Um, what do you think? And he said, well, I want to hear it from you first. So I proceeded to tell him. It turns out when you can engage with stories, people tend to want to pay closer attention. So I told him the story of the ring and, and Nicole crying and Sheila being really upset and four years living together. And now she's, you know, telling me, look, you've got to start making decisions. And so here we are, I'm the float plane, not working from Peterborough and the guy pulling out, uh, landing on the lake. Let's, you know, ask hand in marriage. Is, is this something you'd like to is this something you'd be interested in being involved in? And there's this long pause on the other end of the phone. You know that feeling, right? <laughs> and he's like, yep, let's do this. I went, oh, really? Holy cow, really? Yeah, I'm in, let's rock. I'll see you tomorrow morning. And here's my address in Sudbury. So I hang up the phone. My boss leans over. He says, hey, got any plans to work today? I was like, sorry, boss. I haven't done anything today at all. Hey, yeah, sorry, I can't. I drive over to my in-law's house. I phone them on the way and I said, hey, it's Chris. I'm in the neighborhood. I wondered if I could pop by and say hello. Turns out that I've lived in the neighborhood with them for four years, a kilometer and a half away from their house. Never called them asking if I could pop in and say hello. When I do that, do you think they're expecting me to try to take something from them? Yes or no? Yes, because it's not normal behavior for Chris to give a darn about us and to call us. That is happening in your life and your career. If you're only going to reach out to people to try to take something from them, they're going to feel that. If instead you reach out to people to give value first, you help them accomplish what they're trying to accomplish because you took the time to figure out what they want to accomplish, then you keep your eyes open for things and opportunities and people that they could meet that could help them. You become what Malcolm Gladwell calls a super connector in a book called Tipping Point. When you're a super connector, doors open for you that you didn't even know existed. When you're a net taker, doors close for you and you didn't even hear them closing. You just wonder why the phone stops ringing after a while. So I'm on my way to my in-laws. I'm panicked. I go over to their place. I talk like an idiot for about 30 minutes. And eventually I said, let me tell you why I'm, I've stopped in. And um, Sheila's mom jabs her uh, husband and says, hey, he's doing it. And I said, doing what? They said, nothing. And I proceeded to say, ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And... Uh, and they said, oh my gosh, took you long enough. They reached under the couch. They got a bottle of champagne. They said, here, go. He said, How, you knew what I was going to do? Yeah, that, it was kind of out of character for you. So we figured something was up. <laughs> I get in the car. I drive to Sudbury, Ontario. I pull up to JR's house, knock on the door. She's, uh, his wife says, he's around back. So I go around to the side door. He says, hey, Chris, how are you? I said, good. I brought four lattes, grande, extra hot for the girls on the canoe trip. Uh, and he sees me with the coffees. He goes, oh, you brought me coffee. I said, oh, sorry, this is not for you. That was a lesson in itself. When you can manage people's expectations, it matters. Now, I'm not going to suggest you should under-promise in order to be able to over-deliver, but I would like to suggest that you should over-deliver at every single opportunity you get. When you overachieve other people's expectations, good things happen. In this case, I underachieved his expectations. He saw the coffee and it wasn't for him. You follow?
So I get to Four Lattes, and he says, now, where are we going? I said, we're going to the Chinaguchi Waterway. It might be, um, and he said, which lake are they going to be on? I said, well, it might be Wolf Lake. It could be Chinaguchi Lake. It could be one of the, the four or five other lakes. And he stops me. He says, Wolf Lake? I said, yeah. He goes, ooh, problem. I said, why? What's up? He said, if they're on Wolf Lake, that lake is really small. My plane won't land on Wolf Lake. We can't do it. What are the chances they're on Wolf Lake? I looked at the map. Oh, about 90%. <sighs> you know that feeling? Not a word of a lie. He looks toward the house, smiles a bit, looks toward the house, and he says, honey, you're yes, dear. And he goes, can I borrow your plane? <laughs> what? They have, they have his and her float planes on the dock. I can show you on Google Maps if you want. It turns out he has a uh, Cessna as a 172. I think it's a three-seater that's sitting, uh, three or four-seater anyway, sitting at the end of his dock, the larger plane that we were going to use. And he has a Piper Super Cub, uh, the same 1965, the same darn airplane that this guy in Peterborough had. We walk down to the plane. He starts it up. And uh, it takes a while to start up because he said, look, I took the, the 172 up and I got it all warmed up. The carburetor's warm. Everything's going ready to rock. This thing's going to take a bit longer to start. Just like net giving because it's foreign and weird. It takes a bit longer to start. Just like having Zoom calls when you can't stand looking at your own face on a call and you can't stand hearing your own voice and you don't like this whole environment, it's really hard. It's really awkward. It's like a cold engine not starting. So he puts the key in, we put the headsets on, and I've got the coffees between my legs, and he goes to start the engine, you know, and eventually uh, a couple of minutes of this noise, and the battery's almost dead. He gets out bangs on a couple of things. I'm thinking uh, this is like Indiana Jones. Remember that movie, you know, where he's like, start the plane. It, I'm a little panicked at this point because the fight or flight mechanism is kicking in again. Flight may run away, not get on the plane. And he gets back in and he starts. And there's black smoke. And, and it's almost like you can hear the engine say like, oh, fine, fine. I'll just, I'll start fine. And that, that is going to happen if it hasn't already happened for you as it relates to having meetings like this, my friend, over video calls. That feeling of awkwardness, the black smoke popping up, the engine not working, your audio quits, your video lags, things don't go well, and you think this isn't going to work. You keep going. You keep trying. You have another call and you get more accustomed to your voice and more accustomed to dealing with your flawed self. I'm flawed. There's certain things I don't like about my physique. There's things I don't like about my lighting. There's things I don't like about the microphones. And I make little micro changes. But you just have to start somewhere. You got to put the key in the ignition and turn it on and know that it's not going to work well the first time. Just like the networking that's going to be happening shortly. You've got to have the guts to try some of these things that feel really awkward because all of us are feeling incredibly awkward. And if you lead off with every single interaction you have over the next couple of hours with, hi, this is awkward. Chris told me it's okay to say that I'm uncomfortable. Hey, what, what's something that you're trying to accomplish in your life unrelated to the, the Institute? What's something you're trying to accomplish unrelated even to, to what we're talking about here? And you start taking notes and you connect with them on LinkedIn. And then maybe three months from now, you meet someone who's already accomplished that thing and you make an introduction. That, my friend, is net giving. So we take off on the plane. We end up landing on Wolf Lake, which was weird because she was in the middle of the lake paddling to filter water. And, and we're coming down to land. And I was like, are we going to hit her? And he goes, no, I'll be close, though. <laughs> and she paddles all the way really fast. And we land on Wolf Lake uh, because we see Barb sort of waving frantically. She's like, hi. I told Barb, you know, if you see this float plane, wave so I know where you are. We land, we paddle up to shore, and JR sees me coming unglued. He, he says, oh my gosh, this guy's panicked. He can't even string together a sentence. So he says, Sheila, why don't we take you up for a spin? And she looks over and she realizes, you, Chris, you're here? I told you you couldn't come. <laughs> she's still mad. And she hasn't put together why I might be there. She's, she's frustrated. She goes up for her spin. Uh, we get some cameras and champagne and stuff ready on the ground, and, and uh, they land and JR pulls the plane up to a rock. He ties the plane to a tree, and he makes himself scarce. He hides as well. And, uh, and I reach into the, the fuselage, and I, and I get Sheila's hand as she's stepping off and stepping on the pontoon and then over onto the rocks. And I said, was that a cool adventure? She was like, Chris, it was an amazing adventure. We got to see the portage and the waterfalls and all these things. And it was such a cool opportunity. And I said, good adventure? She said, yeah. I said, do you by any chance want to go on more adventures with me? 
and her hand starts to shake. She's like, oh my, oh my God, oh my, oh my God, oh my, she can't say the whole word, just oh my God, oh my God. And she starts crying, I start crying, I bend down on one knee and JR took this amazing photograph of the plain tail uh, and Sheila with her pink scarf blowing in the breeze with the Canadian shield rocks. And I held out a ring and she said, yes. Every single friend that I told that I wanted to get a float plane and somehow randomly show up on a lake where she may or may not be on a canoe ride, they're like, what if you can't find them? I said, what if I can? What if you run out of gas? What if I don't run out of gas? What if the weather sucks? What if the weather doesn't suck? What if the Zoom meeting fails? What if the Zoom meeting doesn't fail? What if you're not comfortable with you on camera? What if I become comfortable on camera? What if they don't tell you what they want to accomplish? What if they do tell you what? You follow? Nothing great ever happened by someone deciding that it's not possible to try new things. All the great things, all the great discoveries and the opportunities arise when we take the time to write down the goals that we want to accomplish, and then we go hang out with like-minded people who are open-minded enough to try new things. My name is Chris Cummins, and I passionately, passionately believe every single one of us today at this conference are able to make really new connections using technology, sending a LinkedIn requests and booking meetings online. You can potentially leave here with more new friends than you've had in the last couple of weeks if you lead with net giving. And with that, I want to pass it back to our conference organizers and say thank you. Thank you for laughing at the right parts. Thank you for staying engaged, even though this is virtual. And thank you for, for being open to try to connect with the exhibitors, to go hang out with the people at Cargill and understand what they're doing with their innovation stuff. Understand that they can actually run Zoom calls in order to get you and your R&D team hanging out with their R&D team to start collaborating and making new products. These things never happened before. And all of the exhibitors are in the same boat. They're trying new things and being super uncomfortable doing it. Thank you so much for your time today. I'll see you soon.